Okay, what's going on? I see that we're live here. Yep, we are live and we are live some places and not other places. It looks like Facebook is acting up on us again, which it occasionally does. And so we are live and I am so happy to be here again live and welcome everybody. Um, I'm Peter Goldstein, founder and chief synergy officer for We Did It That Health, where our mission is to empower the grassroots ambassadors of the vegan and plant based movement to be even more effective at inspiring friends and loved ones to be curious about an alternative lifestyle, which the alternative being that they stop eating animal proteins and start eating healthy so we can prevent and reverse chronic diseases, so we can be compassionate to all the wonderful creatures we share this planet with, so we can reverse the climate changes that are happening. And it's even the solution for world hunger. So that's our mission, that's our work. Please join us on Facebook, join our community on We Did It That Health and subscribe to our YouTube channel here. So thank you for being with us. And today I have a very special guest, Tammy Hay, who's uh, going to share with us about her work with the million vegan grandmothers. Uh, grandmothers are traditionally uh, viewed by indigenous cultures as wisdom keepers and certainly is so important to keep an eye on that wisdom and keep our hearts centered in that wisdom, uh, especially these days where it's a, it's really wonderful that we have so, so many plant-based foods coming up and it's getting so commercialized to be plant-based. I want to make sure, Tammy especially wants to make sure, we all want to make sure that we keep track of that wisdom, keep track of that earth connection. And it's not just about commercializing veganism, but it's really about the the traditional wisdoms that have been with the earth, with humanity forever. So with that, welcome Tammy, and um, please tell us about your work and, and give us a little more background on, on yourself. And everybody, uh, please feel free to ask questions and we'll be conversation on it. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you everyone for listening and being here at this time, this this precarious time to be on it. There's as much as, I don't know, uh, Peter, if you're able to mute on your end for a sec. Uh, there's some stuff happening there that, great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we're uh, we're in a really precarious time on the planet. There's it seems like there's an awakening like there's never been. A lot of people, you know, see that we're in maybe even end times, but that's not what Peter and I are holding out for. We're holding out for a world of complete awakening where our grandchildren can drink from streams again, maybe one day, and, you know, play back in all the lakes and the rivers because they're so clean, because they're not being polluted with, with animal agriculture and all the stuff that goes along with that. So my name is Tammy Hay, and a couple of years ago in dream time, I dreamt that a whole bunch of grandmothers were coming together. I was talking to a very good friend of mine who has been a vegan for over 50 years. His name is Jeff Francis. He's an artist from the UK, incredible artist. And I'm always talking about my grandkids and how the hottest subject in my grandkids' life is veganism because they're not being raised vegan. So they constantly ask me questions. Can vegans be strong? Is this vegan? And the questions go on and on. And then we have very controversial conversations about, you know, what it's like if, uh, even if we don't eat the fish, but we put a hook in its mouth and what that must feel like. And so my friend Jeff and I, I said, man, my grandkids might mean a lot to me. It feels like a whole other stage I'm going through into my, into my, um, into my being. It's, it's kind of a different depth of love that is hard to describe. And, he said, I, I see the grandmothers coming together, Tammy, that, you know, a thousand vegan grandmothers. 
So later that day, I was sharing that with Silash, Dr. Silash Rao and, Dr. and Judy Carmen, who wrote Homo Ahimsa, or coined the term Homo Ahimsa, originally in her first book, um, For All Beings. And they said, no, you know, if we, if we crunch the numbers, there's easily a million vegan grandmothers out there and we're going to come together and we're going to be a force to be reckoned with. And we no longer will allow this world to be treated in a way of normalized violence. We're coming back to normalized nonviolence and we're coming back to a love-based society for our grandchildren and for the grandchildren and the, and the babies of all species. That's who we're holding space for. Not just the human babies, but all babies deserve to be protected and loved and fed, you know, pure water, pure food, and back eating from the garden. Yes, Peter. So we started galvanizing the Million Vegan Grandmothers this year. We started a YouTube channel a couple months ago and a podcast. So you can just Google us, the Million Vegan Grandmothers YouTube or the Million Vegan Grandmothers podcast. And yes, here we are. We've we've arrived and we've uh, interviewed some great people. One of the we're working in conjunction with climatehealers.org. So climate healers. And on there you'll see the grandmothers. Um, the grandmother's page and we've been writing a lot of letters we've written 14 letters as as to date so thank you well that's that's really cool so how, um tell us what it you know how, about some of the uh the other grandmothers that are involved some of um what it is that you're doing and um and and where people can join you are you having conversations are you having meetings um how far along i know this is this is a new startup and everything is picking up momentum and just getting started what what is currently going on and then tell us about your vision where where you think you'll be in the near future well, thank you peter well, we, we started galvanizing the Million Vegan Grandmothers this year from the, the seed idea. And um, like I said, we are sharing stuff. Uh, we have a YouTube channel now. We have podcasts. We have meetings every second week. You'll find those meetings listed uh, under climatehealers.org under calendar for you and calendar. And we're going to be meeting in the evenings on um, two Wednesdays a month. And in those meetings, the first half, we talk about what the grandmothers have been up to. So whether we've been writing letters, if there's letters that we would like people to start for us, everything from um, contacting the U.S. government to stop funding milk programs in school because the majority of children are allergic to milk. And to you know talk, speaking out against the clubbing of baby seals the babies of us all you know like that is incredibly barbaric and that must stop and the grandmothers are here to protect these 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 cubs that are that are the 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 grandchildren of the seals that deserve to have their young protected and us humans since we're the ones creating the misery we are the ones that need to stop it so you can see all of our letters on climatehealers.org. There's 14. You can grab them, uh, copy them, and forward them. Please, please take these letters and use them to speak out. Speak out either as a grandmother or another citizen that really would love to see plant-based options for children in every school, every hospital. We would like to see plant-based grandmothers are do, starting a really huge campaign where we want to see vegan as the default in hospitals and schools. There's over 20 university institutions in the UK now where the students are saying, we want a hundred percent vegan cafeterias. We no longer want this. So the grandmothers are backing them up and asking every institution to step up. They know this is the very best thing for human earth and animal liberation to stop animal agriculture and that they need to, they need to step up in a way that they're actually coming on board with who we are now. We're homo ahimsas. 
Judy Carmen, who wrote Home with Him, says one is the, one of the grandmothers. Another grandmother is Beth Love, who started Eat for the Earth. She has an, an incredible nonprofit organization, uh, Reverend Beth Love. <clears throat> there's many grandmothers from many walks of life. There's some from India. There's some from throughout North America. And we're gathering. We're gathering in the UK. We're asking people to join. There's a join back button um, under climatehealers.org, under the grandmother's page. And we no longer will allow normalized violence. And that is what we're speaking out for, for human earth and animal liberation, because it cures everything. Being vegan just takes care of so much. Yes. Absolutely. I sometimes I feel like like the evolution of human consciousness, some future near future, near term future evolution has to include being vegan. So any anybody who's compassionate, anybody anybody who loves their pets, I mean the speciesism loving loving our pets and then and then killing other animals and so without a doubt as as we're evolving in our compassion and it, it really i really don't can't imagine uh human consciousness in the near future not including being vegan mm -hmm. well that's it you know we've we've moved out and and anybody that's not updated yet that may be listening we have moved out of normalized violence that is the consciousness that has evolved on this planet and now we need to let our higher selves know that we've upgraded it's just people don't know they've upgraded and i have another theory of this my partner my beloved partner paul and i are writing a book called grief mapping and what we have these five stages of grief where where I actually truly do believe that the reason why people don't upgrade or and or step forward to be part of the grandparents, to be part of we did it, to be part of these passion pods that you're developing, Peter, is because they don't have enough room in their psyche and their soma to be able, they have so much accumulated grief and trauma that they're not able to even imagine what's going on right now. And they don't know how to create space within themselves to be able to step forward and do their part, do their divine part to help clean up what's going on. I believe that when people are free, when we, make, when we help them make space in their psyche and soma by mapping their grief and learning, learning uh, deep empathy, the first stage is felt sense shock. And then we move into empathy for ourselves and every single being that is part of this, part of this, normalized violent world you know everyone is everyone is affected by that and then we move into creative action that's the actual third step we can't wait and go into anger and depression there's no more time we move into creative action so once we feel the felt sense shock start to process it through empathy we move into creative action we join communities that are doing the same and it gives us so much space within ourselves and then we continue to map out our grief and our trauma and release it and that is one of the things that this is a new part of the grandmother's meetings is on wednesdays when we get together to give updates on what we've been doing as as the grandmothers and the grandfathers and sometimes there's grandchildren in there joining the grandmothers all vegan then the second part of our meeting is going to be a support group it's going to be it's going to be a support group based on kind of like the a tradition where there's a little bit of structure where we give structure and we give some really nice house rules of how we're going to go about it, but we're going to support each other so that we can clear off some of the trauma, whether it's that we just were on the front lines at a slaughterhouse or whether, you know, whatever our grief or trauma was from that week or that month or maybe the past, we can bring it forward so that we can witness it for each other and help each other heal so that we make more space to do our work, more space in our psyche and our soma. Well, that, that makes so much sense. That's so beautiful. And, you know, I was actually uh, got, got uh, 
shivers when you when you were talking started talking about making making space in our trauma and 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 clearing some of that out and the, i that makes so much sense is we we want to to move forward with our consciousness and our compassion and our passion and 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 we need space for that so clearing out the trauma clearing out because that just makes so much sense that it's draining our energy our our, our emotional and psychic and psyche energy uh, and and to to make space to be able to be to have space for for compassion is that is that what you're saying am i hearing you right absolutely peter and with the wisdom of the grandparents so i was able to go on a little trip with my daughter and son-in-law and my two grandchildren this last weekend and i could tell by the end of the trip they're under extreme amounts of stress they're selling their house and and there's some real issues with some of the coaches on the hockey team and i could feel at the end of it my my daughter and her husband were very tired and they were being a little reactive with the kids and as soon as I had a little bit of space with my grandson, I was able to completely empathize with what he was doing because the parents were too caught up to see it. It's like, oh, I see what you're doing. You're gathering all your stuff in here. Dad wants you to hurry. He thinks you're not listening. But really what you're doing is making sure you pick up after yourself in the car and, and you were looking for a car that you couldn't find. And thank you, Phoenix, for being such a sweet child, you know, to make sure that you grabbed all your stuff out of the car. And he's like, Oh, you're welcome, Oma. And so the grandparents can witness each other and witness trauma and grief or even um, being misunderstood because we we seem to have that wisdom. You know, the, the grandmother love, when if a grandmother hasn't accumulated too much trauma and grief, it's not always that we have grandparents that have stepped into their wisdom, just to acknowledge that. My grandmother left with lots of grief and trauma. But the grandmothers that have done some of their work and are continuing to make space, you know, the way we love, we it's, come in, let me just hold you. Let me just, it's okay to cry. It's okay to hurt. You know, there's no judgment. And, you know, I was also doing a little bit of inner child work the other day with, with a very uh, amazing somatic practitioner. And she said, what is it like when your grandkids come to you and they're, they're sad or they're frustrated or they have all these emotions they don't know what to do with. And I said, they're all welcome with me. All of those emotions are welcome with me. And she said, so then can you give that to your girl? Are all of the emotions welcoming? Why is it that that doesn't seem very spiritual to have that emotion? And why do you get panicky when this other part of you comes up? When really, if you treated that little girl, the way you treat your grandchildren, all of it's welcome. And it's interesting when you welcome it all, it goes away much quicker. It's kind of like that story of that. I think it might've been, I think it wasn't an elephant in the middle of a house. It was a children's story and no one, it was just a little baby elephant. It might've been a different animal. I'm trying to remember, but it was a kid's story where nobody was noticing this, this animal and the parents wanted to ignore that it was in the house. So they kept ignoring this animal and it got larger and larger and larger and larger and larger and larger until it basically the house popped up and it was walking around with the house on its back because no one was, no one was paying any attention to it. So then as soon as it got attention and got loved and got seen, it got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> Oh, that's a beautiful analogy. I, I don't remember that story. It sounds like I missed a good one, but that's that's really powerful. It's giving giving attention. That's that's so true. So rather than ignoring or sweeping something under the rug or it, it will just fester and, and and keep getting getting louder. Yeah, so interesting because as you're talking, certainly um I'm a grandparent also and I know my children are so incredibly busy making a living and and keeping running the, the their kids around to all the all the activities and and soccer practice and ballet practice and all their activities and it's just I just don't even see how they can do it they're they're so programmed so much going on and and to be able to bring in 
a fresh air of of uh, presence and and calmness and and listening and and that real grounded love. There's there's so much need for that. That's that's beautiful. Well, and it's two ways. In many ways, I mean, because it's coming from divine, it's coming from the earth, it's coming from all the beings of love that hold space for us. But I also know that my grandchildren are great teachers both ways. They're teaching me this unconditional love because they just adore me. And then I'm learning that this love that I feel for my grandchildren, why why do I not have that for all living beings? And so they're teaching me the highest unconditional love. And they teach me that not so I can share it with them and all the other children, but so I can share it with all human beings that are suffering because we all have that child within us. And we all are children just walking each other home, you know? So if we can witness that in each other, you know, I, I had that conversation with my partner this last weekend because we're working through some really big stuff together because we care so much, which is really great. It's, it's that piece. And I said, you know, we can't, we can't ever make it about the relationship. We have to make it about the emotion that's going on. And that's, and that's what we do. You know, we do with children. It's so easy for us to do that with children. You know, I have an early childhood background and we would never say to the child, you're bad. We would just say, hey, you know, when you hit Susie with a truck, that really hurts Susie and look at her crying and, 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 and she's so sad. And, and we're, we use our hands for hugging and loving and making food. We don't use our hands for hurting. Ouch. And, and what's going on for you? Like why or what's going on? Do you need, do you, is, what do you need? You know? So it's kind of that piece. And I'm so curious why we, we're so quick to cut off other people and to tell and to and to take their wounded kind of pieces that are still wanting to be loved home. And we make that we we say, oh, that's who you really are. Now I get to see the real you. <laughs> and I guess the grandmother's wisdom to me, what the grandmother's wisdom has taught me as much as anything, besides the love for my grandchildren is the love that I wish to someday achieve for all humanity. To me, that would be my complete liberation when I can see all living beings as deserving of a grandmother's love. You know, I have a great story. Don't let me forget to tell you. <laughs> well, yeah, please go ahead. Well, I was deeply in love with this grandmother called Ama. She was the hugging she is the hugging grandmother. And Oma is what my grandkids call me, but and it's very easy, always a really simple sound for children, for babies. But my grandson, who's this intuitive little being, he just gets things. He's so emotionally intelligent. And he said he never called me Oma, he called me Ama. And I'm like, oh, maybe one day that will be part of my mission is just to hug people. And I think about how many people, you know, I read a study recently. No, I was in a podcast recently where someone was saying that there was a poll done before COVID happened. I think it was 2018 where it was talked about that 60% plus people in the world said they're incredibly lonely. Wow. You know, and how people are dying of loneliness more than you know, lack of connection. And I think it's a combination to a lot of things, each other, the microbes. I mean, we're eating from chemical factories, so we're losing microbial diversity, which which has us not feeling nearly as connected to the earth. So we're microbial deficient and not very diverse. We're people not very diverse. We're, we're food not very diverse. So our way to come back to that is to collect those hugs again, connect, collect the hugs from the earth, collect the hugs from the microbes. <laughs> yeah, I want to be an ama. I want to be the hugging grandmother that, you know, lets everyone know with such a warm embrace that they belong here at this time. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I, uh, 
there's nothing like a really good heartfelt hug is there just just melting into it and and feeling feeling another person's presence and and through that feeling feeling all of life and feeling feeling the energies of of the world and the universe and all the love that is that is really all around us that we're blocking and that's that's beautiful so so grandmothers to to bring that bring all that back and make all that be there's so much room for it so much need for it and as we're because once we connect with with loving and loving each other i mean loving loving the planet loving loving the trees and and all all living things so it's uh, that i i think that's really that's really what we're meant to be doing yeah and that's what being um, a member of the Million Vegan Grandmothers allows. You know, the name says it all where there's many of us and we're vegan and we have the, the wisdom of, you know, the type of love that heals, not the type of love that possesses or is needy or demands their way, but the kind of love that really truly heals. Yeah. Yeah, well, all of that was was the old world paradigm, wasn't it? It's mm -hmm. the the whole world is is created for for humanity's use and abuse, and and nothing else really mattered. It was just here for us to to eat the animals, cut down the trees, and do anything we want. And and unfortunately, that's or fortunately, that's really not how it is it's we're we're just we're just citizens of planet earth and mother earth and and equals and and not not here to th that's not all put here for for our use and abuse it's it's here for us to share and enjoy and love yeah so um you have you have meetings every second Wednesday night. Is is that did I hear you right? Yeah, we have meetings. We have the first the first um, part of the meeting, the first forty five minutes, fifty minutes, is about what we've been up to. So whether it's letter writing campaign, planning for our convergence, um, maybe we're going to do a presentation. Mm -hmm. Like we have a roundtable coming up January first, and it's going to be called uh, Animal Liberation Now: Mobilizing Grief into Creative Action. That's my baby the next couple of years while I finish this book on grief mapping. And Peter Singer is going to be part of that. And so we're going to be um, having monthly roundtables now um, because there's a huge, there's a huge um, animal liberation uh, conference going on in California in June. I think it's till the 14th of June something like that, maybe a little bit later than that. And Peter Singer, I think, is going to be speaking at. Uh, so it's it's incredible to be able to join together, to have meetings, to have convergences. And we're hoping eventually, monthly, we're going to join together as grandmothers and food healers to serve food around the world at least one day of the month where the grandmothers around the world, when we gather in enough numbers, we're gonna be feeding maybe entire cities that one day. Because the whole idea of food healers is we have enough food to feed the world at least seven times over if we stopped animal agriculture, if we stopped feeding it all to the animals. It's really, as Dr. Gabriel Cousins says, it's a hoarding of resources. We have plenty of resources. We're just hoarding them and feeding them to, to animals that maybe didn't even choose to be here maybe didn't even choose to live the life that they have. They didn't ask us to cut down entire forests for them. This was all human, human made. Uh, and, um, and not even an efficient way to live our lives. But, you know, as Dr. Will Tuttle said in the World Peace Diet, we were all just following orders. And, you know, trying to survive through crashed economies is really what has happened. And so we're coming home, we're coming home. We're coming home to liberate ourselves through plant-based nutrition, but through community, 
you know, I was listening to a podcast with Rich Roll and Zach Bush recently, Dr. Zach Bush. And Zach Bush said something to the extent of, it will be in community that we will fully remember. And that when people are wandering around in loneliness, there's this, there's this constant free floating anxiety that's going on right now. Because there's a lot of anxiety about the direction that our planet um, is heading. But in community, when we're taking creative action and we're supporting each other through that, we don't feel so powerless. We're not just walking around in anxiety thinking there's nothing we can do because there's lots we can still do. And as long as we're working towards creative action, it seems to give us a sense of, of a way to process this. I, I did a great podcast with Deborah Elliott recently. She started uh, something called Teach With Movies. She's in L.A. So I last, uh, had a conversation with her when he was in L.A. last time. And she she's a grandmother, uh, one of the grandmothers. And we did an amazing podcast where she's talking about uh, in – Baja, California, this whale, this whale um, protective place where they, the whales can come in. It's not a sanctuary where the whales are captured. They're just, they can come into this Baja Peninsula. And she said, you know, the, they've shown that the grandmother whales take teach the young, the young cows, and they're actually, and the mother and the grandmother and the and the calves. The parents present them to the boats. These little boats can float in this peninsula just, you know, very um, without creating much of an impact. But the whales actually want contact with the humans. They feel safe in this area. And so they're holding the calves up to be touched and to be known by the humans. And that just really, you know, when Deborah told the story, I, you know, it was very moving for me how when animals feel safe, they want to connect with humans. And I it it made me imagine, you know, like right now I want to cry, but it made me imagine a world where, you know, animals could walk freely around humans all the time when there wasn't that fear anymore. Yeah. Well, so so that's that's beautiful. And to have animals around and so did what was that the way it was once upon a time or or was it that really animals were hunted and uh back in the day in in the way long ago when when people were hunters and gatherers or feared and hunted or was it was there a positive interaction with 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 animals or well i my my knowledge of, I studied with in an Essene community with Dr. Gabriel Cousins and some modern day students. And as far as I know, the Essenes have always been raw food, vegan. Uh, they were mostly white. They were great scholars. And they were very connected with the uh, the natural world and the and the, and the animals that, that that was their ecosystem. And there wasn't a lot of fear. There were some hunter and gatherer um, understanding of past tribal stuff, but there's also a lot of records, you know, ancient records, hi history saying that there were a lot of people that were plant-based people. The history is the archives are showing this now that it wasn't just hunter and gatherers. I'm wondering sometimes if that was the meat industry that was really promoting that because there were a lot of cultures that were plant-based cultures. They know it by their bone structure. They know it by the archaeological records. So I wonder if in those societies, the animals walk freely. I mean, you see a lot of, you see a lot of really old historical even you know egyptian pictures where you're seeing animals walking around with the humans and there was a lot of paintings and a lot of pitch graphs and i'm not so sure if everyone was a hunter and gatherer like they tried to make us think i'm not so certain about that but i do know you know i i do know that people like dr gabriel cousins and uh, rabbi cousins and um saint francis of Assisi and they used to have birds continually land on them while they were meditating or quiet in their garden. 
they had a certain connection and that's what it is when you are quiet enough in your soul and an animal knows that you are not eating animals or any other secretions or contributing to that i'm not claiming that we're safe in the wild you know that will never be a pack all bear because we're vegan i can't claim that i do know though <laughs> that i feel a certain level of protection and safety because i'm vegan and i don't mean that in an arrogant way it allows me to feel like somehow i have a little level of protection certainly that well that that makes sense to me personally i mean that's it's a lot about what frequencies we're vibrating at and a piece they so and i think we we see that even even with domestic animals i mean if we're if we have a a certain uh frequency where we're threatening then then dogs will react to that and and if we have that peaceful feeling and and loving show up lovingly then then they're attracted to us so i'm i'm sure there's and there's all that is true and and way beyond anything that i know i can understand i i was amazed uh, i was i i'm always amazed when i hear something along those lines and and i have no doubt that they they sense it way better than we we acknowledge it and 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 are aware of as as my my hallucination anyways so well um this is this is beautiful and and the the vegan grandmothers what what a great mission and i would love to find ways that we at we did it that health can can support you and and promote your mission um and as we're building a community at we did it that health the thrive and inspire community which is intended to help us all thrive as uh, it, it, with our health and emotionally thrive and and then inspire others to do the same and um we're we're looking for for opportunities i i personally believe and it's it's our vision that we can all we all want to be proactive about creating a, a vegan and plant-based world um so we would love to maybe we can share some of the letters that that you've written and are in your library for various causes that that certainly would would be something i'd love to see our community do that would be great and i know that you have started something called passion pods peter and the grandmothers are going to have a passion pod as one of your passion pods and uh also i think you have one on on health and fitness. And uh, I would love to be able to share, you know, what I've known. My first education was in early childhood. And then I went on to social work. Um, then I went on to become a registered massage therapist, which I still do quite frequently. And then I went on to get a master's in plant based nutrition. So I kind of like to bring in all of those around health and nutrition. And kids are really, you know, even quote unquote pick, picky children as people would call them picky what picky usually means is they've been given a lot of chemical food and so that they don't like regular food but also children are very mono mono eaters meaning that they like one thing often and people put a whole bunch of stuff together and most children that are picky eaters they will do quite fine with raw so they're quite happy with a cut up apple or an orange or a smoothie or and so I think it's parents trying to force their taste buds onto children. Whereas if you had a lot of organic fruit and vegetables and you cut them up and you made them a lovely smoothie, you could slip some stuff in there, like some greens and some, and some hemp hearts and all of that good stuff. But I think children's nutrition is incredibly important. I think children are losing a lot of their brain sovereignty at a very young age because of the horrible nutrition, um, the lack of nutrition that children are getting. And um, nourishment is very important for children, not just that really warm hug, but that, that really beautiful living, you know, food that we can give them that you want them naturally to evolve into these beings that love green. You know, why are, I hear people say, what is that green thing you're drinking? 
Whereas my grandkids grew up making green juice. I mean, I plopped them on the counter when they were babies. They weren't even walking yet, and they were helping me make green juice. <laughs> that's that's beautiful. That makes sense. It's it's they're 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 connected with it, and they'll they'll want it, and they'll feel good about it. So that's a beautiful thing you're doing. Excellent. Yes super it's super easy gabriel cousins wrote a really great book called conscious parenting and that's a worthwhile read for anyone wanting to help their children be um uh to help parents become more conscious and to raise more conscious children and and it's really about getting children involved in sprouting and microgreens and seeing how easy it is to make a smoothie i mean my granddaughter was over the other day and she devised her own drink that she wanted to make she built the recipe in her head and then i had to happen to have the ingredients and she did the whole thing she i mean she took the time to do it she just turned four she said i'm going to make from some fresh squeezed orange juice oma and then i'm going to put it in ice cube trays and then when it's frozen so two or three hours later she helped me plant a bunch of sunflowers and two or three hours later her ice cube trays were frozen and she put that in the blender with uh, a little bit of coconut milk and a couple other ingredients and made herself a creamsicle smoothie. <laughs> Beautiful. A creamsicle. Nice. How old is she? Four. And so four. You know, oh my God. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. At four years old. That's beautiful. Yeah. So when they when they when they're always in touch with real food, you know, real vegetables, real food. And they see people putting together real food all the time, plant-based. They start to imagine. So even though they're not being raised vegan by their parents, my rule is, is that when I take care of them, we only eat vegan. So then, you know, maybe if they would have been apt to go grab a piece of cheese in the fridge, they, and that's not a choice. They have to think of other proteins they would like to eat that's within the yes of Oma's day you know and, and they come up with it they come up with it all the time you know they're they're macronutrients yeah beautiful wow well i so appreciate your wisdom and and all the things that you're sharing and i'm so excited for the work that you're doing and you're doing work on so many fronts um with the with the grandmothers and that's that's our focus here today is to talk about the vegan grandmothers and and that group and those initiatives but i i love how all that trickles down then as grandmothers to to the to the grandkids and 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 our children too because they're they're caught they're they're our adult children and they're caught in the middle and they're they're driven so many different ways and and torn in so many different different directions and it's so beautiful to you, i feel like you're you're adding a very po powerful peaceful uh platform energy environment to to everybody's life with that um well, and speaking of which, Peter, like everyone that's vegan is allowed to join the grandmothers to support the grandmothers. You don't have to be a grandmother. We want the grandchildren in there. We want the we want the grandfathers in there. We want lots of people to join us to all be part of of supporting the grandmothers. It's like any community. If the grandmothers, you know, are the ones that are being listened to in the traditional indigenous way, not just quote put out to pasture, you know. Um, they're actually listened to and, and held in high regards because they haven't forgotten their wisdom. They're still within a community. They're still within the grandchildren and, and the parents and the grandfathers. So please, anyone that would like to support the grandmothers and be part of our mission, join. Uh, go on to climatehealers.org and scroll down. You'll see the grandmothers. You'll see the join us uh, button. And we'll send out regular emails letting you know what's going on, uh, what we're part of. And then all the letters are on there to forward. And then we're going to hopefully this year, the vision that I imagine you had asked me earlier, Peter, before we wrap up today is where do, where do we see the grandmothers going? Well, there's not a million of us yet. That is our goal is to have a million of us. Um, and we imagine having regular events where we're all going, Hey, let's plan an event. You know, 
internationally. Let's plan an event, let's say, to speak out for the awareness of all the cows who have lost their calves. And let's do that across the world today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and how will the media be able to ignore that? And mm-hmm. so, right? And so that is... No, the no way. Okay, internationally, we're going at it today. Today is the day where we're going to speak out for this or that. You know, and what if people all across the world had their eyes on Canada next March, all the grandmothers galvanized everyone around the world to say, we are going to stand right where they're clubbing the seals in Labrador, Newfoundland. We're going to show up 10,000 of us. Yes. You know, this is what we're going to do. And everyone who doesn't show up there are going to be speaking out in their country. And how are you going to be able to ignore us? And so that is the thing. We're not going to be able to be ignored as we gather. So please join us so we can, uh, our numbers will be too much to for mainstream media to, media to um, any longer ignore, right? Because they've been able to ignore the vegan movement for a long time, think it's some sort of passing fad, but it's not. We are creating a vegan world and hopefully at least 50% of us by 2026 is the mission. And and we're we're on our way. We're on our way. I mean, veganism has increased like like it's ne- never has over the last three years. And my daughter kind of said it in an interesting way because I don't I don't do a lot of social media other than what I need to have done for uh, the million vegan grandmothers. But she said, "Mom, if we're not vegan, it's not because we don't know. Everything's all over the place now. Everyone knows what's going on. We're not vegan because we don't want to be." And I'm not criticizing my daughter for thinking that way, whether it's because she's in a she's in a family system with her husband and their family and people that aren't willing to even look at it yet. And the thought of maybe there's so much accumulated anxiety and grief in some people that if they felt that they um, went against the family's wishes, that that would create more grief and they don't have space for it. But that's what community is doing. It's gathering us together so that we can have a community and a whole extended family to support us so that we can bring the information forward into our families and feel strong about it, not make it a negative thing, not make it a, a, you know, a a loveless thing. Ever since I went vegan for my health, when I, when I was dying with Crohn's and I found my way through that, I just show up with two dishes every, every meal I go to that is not vegan and everyone eventually wants my salads more than they want the other food and all of my food goes first and I then they they share recipes and they want to know how to make the dressing which of course is vegan you know with hemp hearts and lemon and and they're like and then so instead of buying that stuff that's got made with milk in the store they're wanting to make their own dressings and and you know we can't always affect people to go vegan, but we can show up happy and joyful mm-hmm. and loving. And they're going to be like, a little bit of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what is it you think that's keeping people from being vegan? If, if people know, and, and I think if I heard you right, you were, you were talking about your daughter saying that it's not that we don't know what what is it that's keeping them from from being vegan i think part of it honestly peter as i write i i had this vision for grief mapping a couple years ago about a year and a half ago and um as a third book i'm going to write and i've been i usually get an idea and then it takes me a good year before i really really get down and, and get writing a lot on it but I usually have to come up with the why, why I'm writing it. That comes after the vision of writing something. And I, my why really is this. We need to free up people's soma and psyche. We need to help them understand that they have so much unfelt and unrealized sorrow that they don't have room to look at something so catastrophic as animal agriculture. And if we can help people free up their psyche and their soma, meaning their tissue, 
the soma of your body that, that they hold all the memories of. You can help them make space in that. They're not going to not want to see. And they're going to go, oh, my goodness. I realize that a lot of my anxiety and grief that I have within me now, I'm creating within myself by eating the suffering and the death and the fear of other beings and contributing to it karmically. So once they stop doing that, they're going to start feeling better immediately. But in order to stop doing that, we need to help them understand that if they freed up some of that grief that they carry within themselves, that they will have room to look at least a bit at what's going on, enough to make the change. Then when they make the change, even if we say try it for 30 days, just try it. And maybe as soon as you feel good enough after going plant-based for 30 days, watch a couple documentaries and then you'll never be able to go back. Watch mm -hmm. Earth and what the hell, you know? Yeah. So I think we need to make space. It's the same thing with meditation. We have to have space between our thoughts, you know? Well, that's beautiful. And and I I see that we're running out of time and we have a couple of comments and I'm sorry we didn't get to them, but um, uh, I, I guess I will ask you the one, one question that's come up is, uh, this has to do with your granddaughter. Um, let me see, where is it? Uh, something about, um, wow, I can't find the question now. Um, Oh yes, do, do they ask why you are vegan and what do you and or do they understand that you're vegan? So do they does your granddaughter ask you why you are vegan and does she understand it? Yeah, so it comes up quite frequently. It started out with my grandson a conversation when he was 3. He said "Oh ma, do you want to go for a cheeseburger at McDonald's?" and and my his parents don't feed him McDonald's, but it must have been somebody else that took him there. And I said, no, 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 I don't eat cows. And I don't eat, I don't eat baby cows milk either because that's supposed to go to the baby, the calves, not, not people. And, and so I could see the wheels turning and he didn't talk to, he didn't talk about it. That was the end of the conversation until about a month later. And I got a text from a very frustrated text from his father saying, stop brainwashing my children. <laughs> <laughs> brainwashing oh my goodness and i said well i'm not brainwashing them but i i promised just like silash promised kamaya that he would always tell her the truth and mm -hmm. i'm just telling him the truth that i don't eat cows and yeah. that i don't eat baby calves milk so then yeah. that just, so when is so when my son-in-law said oh okay he couldn't argue with the fact that i'm just going to tell my grandfather the truth then questions happen almost every single time we're together, which is once a week. So my one daughter, who's a veterinarian doctor in the States, she said, I have never heard a family, children of family that talk so much about veganism. So my son-in-law says, even when they go to stores, Hadley will go, well, that's healthy. And I think that's vegan. And then that, and he <laughs> said, there was this woman in the wild working and she goes, how does she know so much? And he goes, because she's got this grandmother, tells her what's healthy, what's not healthy, and what's vegan and what's not vegan. So yes, I tell them because I love, I love the animals and because I love the earth and because I love humans and they deserve to be well and they can be really, really well if they eat plants. But the biggest conversation that goes on is their father's always saying, Vegans can't be strong. So the last time I was there, I put on part of Game Changers with my, for my six-year-old grandson. And he's like, Dad, you have to see this. So then his dad <laughs> says, says this to him. Well, that's just because they take bad vitamins. <laughs> and I'm like, no, not all, not all, very few vegan bodybuilders take steroids because most of them are animal steroids. So no, that's not happening. They're strong because you can get strong being a vegan. So that seems to be the biggest conversation. But a while ago, my grandson said to me, okay, well, why don't you have an arm wrestle with mom? And she's not vegan. She eats mostly vegan, but not 100%. And she works out all the time, lifts very heavy weights, and she's 30, so she's half my age. And I thought for sure she it would just be a simple, ah! you couldn't put me down on either arm. Nice. 
I was <laughs> happy about that. Beautiful. Wow. Well, look, I know I know it's uh, time to end this, and I know you have to run. This has been amazing, and I look forward to to continuing the conversation. And you know what? For we did it that health. Uh, July is going to be babies children's and families month so maybe maybe we can get you involved with that and and uh, have a conversation about children's nutrition and uh, and you have such a wealth of knowledge and so diverse and in, in all that you've done and all that you're doing so uh, I look forward to next time let's 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 uh, bring in some more of your wisdom and your sharing and and all the love that you're sharing with grandchildren with and with all living things on this planet so with thank you very much peter it's been a pleasure namaste tammy think namaste vegan <laughs> thank you bye bye everybody big hug yes big hug.